Welcome to Interviews from Mexico. I'm Laura Carlson, and I'll be your host as we look at cutting edge issues with the men and women who know them best, here on Telesur. Immigration has become a hot-button issue in Mexican foreign relations, mainly because Donald Trump has made it a hot-button issue in the United States, which has a tremendous amount of influence over Mexico. The incoming government of Andrés Manuel López Obrador has said that it doesn't want to have a crackdown. It wants to move away from that repressive model, and it wants to go on to looking at the root causes. On today's show, we want to move beyond looking at immigration as an ideological debate, a heated debate, which it has been in both countries. And we want to talk about what could be some of the real solutions, especially now that there's a new government coming in. To do this, we're very fortunate to have with us here in the studio, Leticia Calderón Chelius. Leticia is a researcher at Instituto Mora. Leticia, thanks so much for being with us today. Muchas thanks gracias. a lot. Leticia, here in Mexico, immigration has become much more complicated. It used to be that when we talked about immigration, we were really talking about Mexicans moving to the United States in huge numbers and the kinds of challenges that they face there. Now we're talking about at least three different kinds of flows. We have Mexicans moving to the United States in much lower numbers than we've seen in the past. But then we have much higher numbers of Mexicans who are returning, either voluntarily or deported, mm -hmm. and we have a huge increase in the flows of Central Americans coming up through Mexico, many of them trying to get into the United States. So let's start with Mexicans in the United States, the traditional area. With the incoming government, what are some things that could be done to protect and defend Mexicans who are living in the United States and are finding themselves faced with, with the threats from the Trump administration to a degree that we really hadn't seen before? One of the biggest problems that Mexico has is having an enormous Mexican community in the United States that doesn't have documents, a situation that over time has not only meant vulnerability for that population, but also for the country, because it has a very unequal relationship with the U.S. government, which became evident with Donald Trump and became much more harmful. The problem is that it's not an issue that Mexico can resolve directly, but it's an internal issue for the United States. What Mexico can do, and I think this is where things are advancing, is to create a whole new situation where, at some point, the parts of the Mexican populations that are really interested in returning to Mexico can do it, and at the same time, to pursue protection mechanisms at the diplomatic levels, at the level of human rights, where the Donald Trump administration has been on the borders, on the verge of violating those human rights. Even when, well, you can say that legitimately, in terms of law, they can make progress in some of the issues related to the rise in deportations that you mentioned. So it seems to me that a new political framework in Mexico is very good for the Mexican community that lives in the United States. Because if the narrative of their home country changes, that will also make them stronger in terms of the political demands they can make. And not just, let's say, in a context of asking for mercy, like asking not to be deported, or asking for amnesty, or make demands, but rather from a more empowered position to be able to say, we want to be here because we want to be here, because it interests us, it's our life choice, but we not necessarily because of this other discourse, which is, well, that we don't want to go back, because it's a country with a lot of problems. That's always been the problem with the Mexican population in the United States, that the United States interprets this as a completely domestic issue, that they refuse to discuss it in terms of foreign relations with their closest neighbor, with Mexico, and that in that sense, the Mexican government has had very little leeway to improve it. But when you talk about changing the narrative, are there specific
specific tools beyond the discourse that could be used to create this sense of, look, these are people who are contributing to your society. These are human beings that under international laws have a right to be here and have a right not to be harassed, detained, deported summarily. Uh, some of the things, family separation, you know, some of the things that we're seeing now. Are there real tools that the government could use to do that? I imagine that they are thinking, especially in the consulates. They told us that the consulates are going to become much more effective as defenders, not just in terms of social problems, which is fundamental, but also on a legal level. The problem here is that the level of legal defense has to do with U.S. law, and for that, we need lawyers who know those laws. And we also need to incorporate the Mexican community in the United States to understand what exactly their demands are. You were talking about something that is very painful and very sensitive for the community, and that's the family separation. Part of the big drama, apart from the human drama, is the quantity of problems that these families confront when they need to, after the emotional shock and the psychological impact, to be able to achieve either reunification, because for separated families, that's what they want. Or in the case where the families decide to remain separate, for example, that the children remain in the United States, when the family decides that, to be able to have the conditions to be able to not face legal processes where many families have had to even lose custody of their children. So the Mexican government knows that information, but they haven't been effective enough given that we have all the information to be able to know that. For example, judges in the United States sometimes judge a person because they didn't show up to their court date. Well, it's obvious they've been deported. These kinds of things, which are so obvious, what we're seeing is that Mexican government needs to raise its voice and deal with this in a much more open way, a much more generalized way, so that this kind of cases doesn't keep happening in the same way, so that when people want to reunite their families, they can do it immediately. Well, let's move to that category. I mean, first I wanted to say that it's important when you were talking about family separation, people think of these dramatic scenes at the border where uh, families come across the border, usually Central American, and they're immediately separated. But there's that whole invisible part to it of families, oftentimes Mexican, who have lived in the United States for years or even decades, and suddenly, because of this aggressive policy of detention and deportation, they're without a parent. Um, uh, their, their, their family is divided as well. And we have to take that into account in family separation. But if we move then to the subject of the increase in Mexicans who are being deported or who are deciding, oftentimes because of the level of harassment they're facing, mm -hmm. to come back to Mexico, there you'd think that the Mexican government would have a lot more margin to create some policies to, to help them, no? Exactly. That's the point. There are many ways that Mexico can negotiate and argue diplomatically in the United States to defend Mexicans there. But there's one part that is absolutely a political decision by Mexico and the Mexican government and Mexican society, and that can't wait another day. I'm talking about when people are forced to return, or they plan to return to a certain extent because when people don't want to move from the place they are, well, that's already a violation of the right to decide where to be and where to live and where to raise their children. And that, well, I say we have to separate it because, unfortunately, what has happened is a pattern of returns that was much more violent and continuous with Obama than with Trump. In spite of his rhetoric, we know that very well. With Donald Trump, there have been 20s, but not in the numbers that we saw with Obama. So one of the questions is, since this new pattern of return became much more visible and in these much larger numbers, the Mexican government has had enough information based on studies by the government itself, as well as civil society and academia, to have a perfect understanding of these issues at hand. 
which can be resolved immediately. And with that, they can alleviate many of the problems associated with forced return. For example, there is a central issue in Mexico law, which is that we don't have universal identity documents. People suffer so much because they can't, as I said before, after the emotional shock, after the pain, well, life goes on. And people can't get back to their lives in many ways because they can't even, for example, rent an apartment, cash check, or enroll their kids in school. And that implies a violation of rights. Because in Mexico, every child has a right to go to school by law, but not in practice. When they face this first obstacle, which is the lack of documents that I'm telling you about among the undocumented population in the United States, but they are Mexican citizens. Yeah. So what is very clear to us, and I would really like to emphasize this, is that in Mexico, an enormous country, a very rich country, Laura, it's the 14th richest economy in the world, with a lot of inequality, but a lot of potential, it's incredible that we haven't been able to resolve this. After 10 years of very visible returns, basic questions that would have been prevented a huge amount of pain for people, and a lot of the problems associated with the fact that the return is so feared and so painful. It's so difficult. Well, why do you think that is? I mean, is there a lack of political will to do it? What kind of obstacles are they facing? Because they're fairly simple, bureaucratic measures that could be taken to resolve these problems of the right to identity. And it's been 10 years, you say, so what's going on there? One part of it is that it's politically invisible. For Mexico, the issue of migration hasn't been a priority. It comes up when it's politically, in terms of countries, an issue that Mexico faces, and that's why Donald Trump really made the issue important in our country, because the government at the highest level had to confront such an aggressive discourse. But really, this has always been the tone of the bilateral relationship. The only thing is that it changed with the strong tone of Donald Trump. Now, this for Mexico, believe me, has had a positive impact for Mexico. Why? Because it forced civil society, public opinion, commentators to recognize that migration is an issue that is invisible in our country. Return, even though it has been happening in a sustained manner for the last 10 years, this current flow of forced return that's happening now, starting, like I said, with Obama, what it has really done is that because politically it didn't affect anyone, nobody wins or loses, no one is protesting for not doing it. Even though there is pressure and there are certain empowered groups, but really Mexican society made this issue invisible until Trump came along, right? Mm -hmm. That's the only positive element of this whole issue. Now, what is very clear is that there is a series of things that aren't going to change whether return rates go down or stay at the level they are at now. Things that aren't going to change. Like what things that aren't going to change? Well, there's still going to be return. That won't change. And the migratory dynamic between the two countries will continue because, well, our demographics are intertwined. It's one of the most integrated countries in the world, according to the relationship, the, the United Nations measures between the United States and Mexico. Do you think that the new government will have a different attitude? Um, we're already seeing then a positive, ironically, effect mm -hmm. of Trump to make the plight of these people who are coming back more visible within Mexican society. And we're seeing a slightly different discourse on the part of the government of Andres Manuel López Obrador. Do you think that they will then finally step in and resolve some of these problems? Look, I just want to be very clear about this. Trump's impact is positive in terms of making the issue visible, but not in terms of the aggression, which hasn't been just rhetorical. The return has been, people have been spending a much longer time in jail in the United States before being deported. And well, I just wanted to make that very clear. Very important. And, yeah, and the other important part of the political change which is happening in Mexico and which will happen in a much clearer way in December, I think that it's positive in a lot of ways. First of all, because the issue of migration is on the agenda. Starting with all the tours that López Obrador did when he was running for 
president. The issue was there. And that hasn't been the case in other presidential elections. It's only been the case in moments when, like, with Donald Trump when he became president and they had to respond in some way, and one of the worst responses was to invite Donald Trump to the country so that he could show up and become a president with an international appeal. With that photo in Mexico, which for Mexicans is an affront that we will carry for the rest of our lives. So, you know, it's a part of internal policy for us, but I think that it has a very powerful historical context. The other thing... He went back to Arizona and gave one of the most hardcore anti-immigrant speeches of his campaign the same day. Exactly. It's terrible, right? And well, it was part of what influenced his own career in the institutionalized revolutionary party to continue governing the country, right? But I think that the new narrative that the new next government is bringing, the new government of López Obrador and his group, first of all, because there are a lot of people who work on the issue of immigration and know it very well, who are in, in the government, who are part of the government, and that's important. The other thing is that there is a very sensible narrative change. First, the issue is being talked about. That sounds unbelievable. People who are listening are probably going to say, what are you talking about? In Mexico, we don't talk about, we talk about it in a dramatic way. They make TV shows, they do news reports about certain moments. But when the story goes away, when it stops being front page news, the issue goes away. Right? Like the issue of the immigrant children, the drama of those children who are being detained, separated from their parents, that was a boom. It was an issue that scandalized and horrified us. But there's so much hypocrisy that is just goes away and no one remembers it. That happens with a lot of issues. But I noticed it with immigration because of how sensitive it is. So what we have here is that in the final analysis, a new narrative, a new discourse that recognizes the role that Mexico plays as a country that expels people, even though the number of Mexicans that leave has gone down, we can't say that Mexicans don't leave because the problem that would imply denying the problem. That's one thing. And the other is that we also need to recognize or to change, let's say, the equation of migration. If the country and its rulers recognize that part of the contemporary migration has to do with economic precarity and insecurity and corruption, well, that wouldn't resolve the problem overnight. But it would change the tone of the, of the way migration has explained in our country. What López Obrador calls root causes, which he has always emphasized in terms of at least the long-term solution to immigration, which is also kind of a blow to this concept that Trump tries to sell and that has been part of the mythology of immigration in the United States for a long time, that people come up to, to our country without documents because our country is so great, you know, because they just like it and it's the best country. But here when we start talking about, well, what are the real reasons and recognizing that a lot of people are in a situation of forced migration, then it opens the door to a whole kind of new area of policy solutions. Do you see them moving forward and in what specific ways? Well, I see it in some very specific things. For example, in the fact of recognizing that in Mexico there are areas that have historically expelled migrants and that now with the violence there is a new profile of migration. But also that we're recognizing a profile of migrants that are, well, in a certain way, qualified. That contributes enormously, just like other sectors to the U.S. economy. But to say it out loud, and not just in terms of speeches in the United Nations, but also in terms of programs in our country. And I want to give you an example of a case that is very interesting to me that the future president has talked about, generating conditions for development towards the southern part of our country. Because because that is one of the migratory flows that really expanded in the past few decades. And, of course, it's happened because of issues of economic precarity. So that kind of change of stimulating the economies of the poorer parts of the country, it does have the intention of changing people's life conditions and migration. And the president-elect has said as much, and I want to emphasize it. It seems like a simple thing, but it's a totally changed 
change rhetoric and tone. He has said that people can continue to migrate, but because they want to, because feelings, love of families bring us together, but not because they have to do it. So we're going to promote migration in that sense, when people want to, when people want to have that life experience, but not as it has happened until now that people are forced to migrate. And that is a huge distinction because it also it's enormous. It, it, it implies much more dignity to the migrant in terms of making life choices and it restores the notion that every human being has the right to make those kinds of life choices. And there's another issue here that shouldn't be overlooked, which is the fact that for Mexicans who live outside the country, the fact that their country be a country that's respected, a country with an acceptable reputation on an international level, where it's not a reference point for corruption, for waste, for abuse, criminality, drug trafficking, well, simply by empowering people, empowering Mexicans, obviously those who are outside the country, that gives a new interpretation, a sense of dignity, a different reputation for their country, not only in folklore terms, Laura, which is always a big part. You know, mariachi, our ancestors, the pretty parts of our Mexican culture. No, also the things that make us a country today. And with that dignity that we can have by changing the equation of what Mexico is today. So the culture has a big role to play in that too, and recovering and restoring. Culture and, culture and also political culture. I mean that you have a country to refer to that isn't just drug trafficking, but it's also a country that tries to get ahead, you know, that has decent leaders, that doesn't make you ashamed to say that it's your home country when you're in the United States. Well, not just a country you don't want to go back to for really unfortunate reasons like before. And and that change also strengths the Mexican community in the United States. You talked about then the new government beginning to take a much more precise view of where the zones of expulsion are, where are migrants leaving from, why are they leaving, is it by choice, is it by obligation. One of the programs that they've announced has to do with the border area because between returns and people who kind of get stuck there because of the security build up on the U.S. border. We have uh, uh, a lot of migrants in that area and they've been talking specifically about a program there. What would that look like? Well, I think that one of the areas that is included in the López Obrador's policy program has to do with changing parts of the economy in the northern border zone, and the kind of taxes that are paid there, and some very clear necessities that have to do with geography that has an enormous impact on the consumption of gas or issues like that because of the hostile climate. So, by contributing to a certain kind of development in these zones, which are receiving part of the flow, well, that also means recognizing that it is happening and not denying the fact. And I'm going to mention another issue, which is very simple, the issue of remittances. Here we talk about remittances in a really, a very optimistic way about her remittances are going up, and how they keep sending more, and our paisanos over there are sending more and more. And that is undeniable and enormous contribution for our country. The problem is that what we've seen is that in 30 years, not much longer, remittances have allowed some families who receive remittances to break out of poverty. But it hasn't changed the structure of the places that receive remittances. And on the contrary, some of those places like Guanajuato, Michoacán, Zacatecas have had very powerful anti-poverty programs. And we have to ask, where is the money? If people are sending money, and they've also received money from programs like Pronasol and all those anti-poverty programs. What's happening? Here is that again. Corruption is sucking up, including remittances. If you really had remittances that had a real productive impact in the country, there will be parts of the country that would have already be highly developed as a result of remittances. And that's not the case.
How does, the, how does corruption affect just family to family remittances? Well, simply, well, first of all, you have these extremely high costs to send money, which end up diluting the benefit for families. But the other thing is that there is a, let's say, a very complicated aspect that is part of the Mexican political system of today, which is that the money comes in, but it goes through somewhere else. But they also get money from poverty programs, which at the end of the day, if you don't have potable water or you don't have a road to get to school or transportation, well, then that benefit ends up being nothing more than a little gift, a contribution that allows you to get through the month in a little better shape. And it's only for some people but it doesn't have an impact on the quality of life of the population. And you could say, if they've been migrating for 30 years, sending significant amount for 30 years, and also receiving government support, you could have very developed areas, but that's lack of not infrastructure, the case. A lack of productive capacity building. That's right, exactly. So then the question is, why aren't those areas rich? And the thing is, we need to get back to the root cause of a lot of these things, and it has to do with corruption. So by rethinking that and thinking about things in a different way, including remittances, that's an important change that we need. And that, of course, has been really the priority of the government of López Obrador during the campaign and and we can assume that there will be quite a bit of emphasis on rooting out that kind of corruption. Yep. Well, let's turn quickly to the problem, um, crisis, some have said, of Central Americans coming up through Mexico. We just talked about the northern border and some specific projects to uh, increase development and the capacity to adapt to the changes that are happening there. The southern border is another story. Um, one of the things we've seen recently is that there's a proposal on the table, uh, Donald Trump to give an additional, because there's already been money given, you know, $20 million to help Mexico basically crack down on Central American migrants and refugees on its own southern border, principally between Mexico and Guatemala. What's happening there and what can we expect under the new government? Well, the current government, the Peña Nieto administration still in office, hasn't received, or in spite of the speculation that exists, has not accepted because of the pressure from the future president, the nation's incoming administration that money in exchange for deporting people. So there's a dispute. There's a lot of pressure because, of course, in the context of our relationship with the United States, you can't underestimate that pressure. And it's not a question of just standing up to the U.S. and trying to confront it with just this course. It's a very complicated situation. But the intention of the Trump administration to try to make us accept the third safe country in the long run has an enormous implication for Mexico, a very dangerous implication, because Mexico hasn't even properly resolved the issue of asylum in our country. The permits aren't handled correctly. Everything that Mexico has signed over the years, and you have a lot of people living in limbo, people who have the right to request asylum in our country. People who are coming from terrible situations. Of course, they don't come from no, you know, they're not come to say hi, they're coming because of very difficult issues, very painful stories, and of course, many of them come from political, economic situations where all of these countries, like Mexico and the United States, have some responsibility. Absolutely. But I'm talking about Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, but the point here is that at the end of the day, the Mexican government can accept that because it's a situation that isn't really going to allow us to improve people's lives or make a commitment to something that is in part of our plans. It is important to change the points of reference, but this is not the way we're going to fix the problems. And I think that that, and I'm an optimistic in the sense, the future government that takes office in December is rejecting this possibility from the outset. Leticia, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the program. These are very important points that have to do with some real challenges for the new government. So I hope that we can talk to you again soon about how Mexico is doing on this vital issue for its future. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Laura. And thank you all for watching. We'll be back next week on Interviews from Mexico. Thank you.